Today on an all-new Dr. Phil, it's Piers Morgan in an Election Week exclusive. I'm so happy that you're still on air through these troubled times because I don't think America and the world has ever needed you more. Piers isn't afraid to speak his mind about anyone, including his friend, Donald Trump. I found Donald Trump's presidency this year handling these terrible events really lacking. I was very surprised when he called me. Plus, two siblings who haven't seen each other because of their opposing political views. I'm shocked that we're here, actually. You've not seen your sister for two years? Yep. How does that feel? You've just made me so angry, and you've hurt me so deeply. I had no idea this was affecting you this way. Is it really worth sacrificing your relationship over who's in power? Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. Well, boy, do I love today's show. Americans have been bombarded with nonstop stresses this year. A pandemic, quarantine, homeschooling, social distancing, a tanking economy, the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, wildfires, children in cages at the border, Supreme Court drama, early voting controversy, and angry citizens protesting in the streets nonstop. This has not only been an unimaginable year, but also the most contentious presidential election in decades. And we're going to talk about it. Take a look. Unrest in America, from orderly protests to violent acts of rage. Anger over the death of George Floyd erupts across America. COVID is spreading faster than ever in the U.S., with the highest one-week average of new cases since the pandemic began. Fire crews are on foot trying to stop these flames from spreading. Hurricane force winds have prompted urgent red flag fire warnings tonight in Southern California. Over 500 children remain separated from their families as a result of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy at the southern border. My body, my Republicans have made history by confirming Justice Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Her confirmation is the first this close to a presidential election. The coronavirus is changing when and how we vote, and that has launched an intense political and legal battle over the ballot itself. We will turn this city red! President Trump is deepening the threat of a constitutional crisis after the November election. He has refused to promise that he'll leave office peacefully if defeated. There are some questions about that ballot drop box that popped up in Canyon Country. The LA County Registrar says it is not official. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. The NYPD put the finishing touches today on a plan to protect residents and businesses as the city prepares for possible election unrest. Some stores in Soho, hard hit last time, are taking no chances. Let's just be honest, 50% 50 of the population is not going to be happy. Well, I want today's show to be a wake-up call for not just one side or the other, but for everybody, no matter which side of the political aisle you may be on. I want you to wake up to your own power, your own strength, your own resolve. We need to empower each other and become united again. My guest today says he wants the same thing, so much so that he wrote a book about it. Now, before we meet him, let's take a look at him doing what he does best. How dare you not go with the woke crowd? Let me tell you about the woke crowd. There are a very small number of people. There aren't many of them, but my God, they make a lot of noise. I can get enraged about all sorts of things. I wake up in the morning simmering, right? I read about vegan sausage rolls. I want to go nuts. I hate Google today. On the left, you had the old Google salad emoji, and there was an egg in it. So, because they don't want to upset vegans, that's Google so has now removed the egg. How crazy the world's gone. Sorry. If you don't eat steak, I'm going to kill you. It's well, exhausting to be woke. 
because you have to think all the time the wrong thing about everything. <laughs> what the world really needs right now is a female yes. woke James Bond. What a yeah. load of horsemen you are. Right. This whole gender debate, to me, mm -hmm. has got completely out of control. Kids identifying yeah. as gender fluid, non-binary. It is nonsense. You and I have talked about Trump for years. I think in this crisis he's been terrible. Coming out with ludicrous, crazy theories about bleach, which he then claims were a sarcastic joke. And my problem about liberals today is they've become so illiberal, they're only interested in making other people agree with them and think like them. And if they don't, they no-platform them, they ban them, they cancel them, and it is utter nonsense. Well, joining them by Zoom from his home in London, please welcome editor-at-large of DailyMail.com, host of Good Morning Britain, and the author of the new book, Wake Up. And I'm talking about Piers Morgan. Piers, how you doing? I'm so happy that you're still on air through these troubled times because I don't think America and the world has ever needed you more. <laughs> well, thank you for that, and I agree there's a lot to be addressed right now. And in full disclosure, I, I, I want to say to everyone, Piers and I are, are very good friends. I consider him to be a, a dear friend of mine. We also uh, work together on another show that I executive produce, Emmy-winning show, Daily Mail TV, now in its fourth season. And Piers is good enough to uh, do some things for us on that show. The title of your book is A Call to Action. Uh, and it's Wake Up. And I have read this book cover to cover. Congratulations on this book. It is needed. It is on target. Uh, why do you think we need to wake up? Because you talked about the need for all of us in this extraordinary year to get a sense of perspective, to work out what is important in life, to understand the most valuable things we have are our health, our family, our friends, our community. Uh, and to look at who has really, this year, I think, shown themselves to be very important in our lives. And that's the health workers, the care workers, the store workers, the people that take our trash away, the people that got us going and kept us going through the pandemic, through the lockdown so far. The book is really a clarion call from me, predominantly at my fellow liberals, because I identify as more liberal than not but particularly the woke crowd, as I call them. These are the ultra-liberal people. Well, they claim to be ultra-liberal. In fact, they're very illiberal. And they have slowly gathered momentum and power, and they've done it through a very aggressive use of social media. And they really want to dictate how all of us lead our lives. And being woke originally was a good thing. It meant that you were socially and racially aware of injustice. But it's become an excuse to basically order people how to think, uh, what to find funny, what movies and TV shows they should like, what haircuts to have, what clothes to wear, what food to eat, whether they should drink, and if so, how much, and what they should drink. In other words, every aspect of our lives. And it's developed this huge culture war that rages 24-7, again, driven by social media, that I think is really harmful to democracy, certainly not liberal, and I, that's why I say, let's wake up, let's get our priorities right again, let's go back to what is important in life, and not what a small group of very noisy people on social media tell us is important. Well, you know, I, I watch this, and I, I've always thought about liberal, and I never talk politics here, and I'll argue each side equally, but I, I always thought about liberals as being very inclusive, just kind of everybody has a home here. But yet, I, I now see this ultra uh, left-wing group of, of, you call them liberal fascists, who are really a bullying crowd. And it is a small, highly vocal minority that's using social media uh, to attack and, and dictate. And I think that's who you're talking about, right? Yes, and it's very damaging because... What it means is that people are more and more afraid to express an opinion. And yet the bedrock of any democracy, whether it's in America or the UK here, is that we debate things. You know, your show has been built around having honest debate about all sorts of stuff. You and I have agreed about things. We've disagreed about things. But at the end of it, we've stayed friends and good friends. And I value that friendship. What is being lost in this woke frenzy 
is that ability to have different opinions, to have a friendship group where people maybe support Trump, don't support Trump, like Joe Biden, don't like Biden, you know, like vegan food, don't like vegan food, whatever it may be, you ought to be able to have honest democratic debate. And when I see uh, the universities now, uh, all over America and all over the UK, no platforming any speakers that don't sign up you know, very carefully to this ultra woke liberal view of life. Uh, I, I get scared for what kind of education our young people are getting if the only thing they ever hear is a validation of their own echo chamber fueled by Twitter, by Facebook, whatever it may be. And it's not just a left problem. It's been a problem on the right, too. But oh, the course. left has always positioned itself as the, the side of freedom and democracy and free speech and expression. And yet they're now behaving, as you said, and as I've said, like a liberal form of fascism. Well, we're going to talk more about that later. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, Pierce's friendship with Donald Trump has had more ups and downs than 2020. Now, they're back on speaking terms after a recent 25-minute phone call. But who called whom? You might be surprised at that answer, and we'll find out what the call was all about. That's next. When this thing started, the president's job was to calm things down. Instead, he said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. He said, proud boys, stand back and stand by. What was he thinking? And later... He believes in Biden, and I think that President Trump is the man of the hour. The difference in political views have damaged our relationship to the point where I just want to have nothing to do with her. Well, you've not seen your sister for two years, but you're seeing her now. How does that feel? <laughs> 2020 has been a year of unimaginable challenges. DailyMail.com editor-at-large Piers Morgan joins me from London and has written a book that I highly recommend called Wake Up. Now, Piers isn't afraid to speak his mind about anyone and everyone, including his friend, Donald Trump. He said, proud boys, stand back and stand by. This disgusting bunch of violent, racist bigots have now got that slogan on their website. What was he thinking? I'm basically, you know, a, a liberal, right? I'm not a right-wing guy, I'm not a conservative. But when I hear you liberals say that he's the new Hitler, you completely lose me. He is someone I consider to be a friend of 10 years. I like him personally. He's, he's an incredibly loyal guy, if you're loyal to him. When this thing started, the president's job was to calm things down. Instead, he said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And from the moment well, he said that, true, from the moment the he said that, there's been total carnage on the streets of America. Well, what would your mother have made of her little boy, Donald, being the guest of honor at Buckingham Palace. You were unusually yeah. well-behaved last night. Well, I have great respect for her. And yes, I think I'm on good behavior most of the time. Coming out in his car today, what gesture and is it to the security detail? What gesture is it to their families that the President of the United Everyone States puts their, puts their life at risk like that? The message is, if you've got coronavirus, get out in your car and go for a joyride. Well, Pierce said on Fox and Friends, and he made the statement to Trump, if you'll refollow on Twitter, I'll give advice on how you can win the election. Uh, so did he refollow you? He did not refollow me. He did actually tweet about my book, which was very nice of him. Right. Uh, but it was interesting. He was watching Fox and Friends when I called him out, and that's why he rang me. And I was sitting at home, and the phone goes. It's a White House switchboard, and they put me through to the President of the United States. And I've been very critical of Donald Trump this year, of his handling of the pandemic, and also of the aftermath of the appalling killing of George Floyd. But I consider myself to be a longtime friend of the president. And I've always believed that my job, since he's become president, is to be a critical friend. In other words, to say when I agree with him and say when I disagree with him. I think, frankly, all friends should be like that. Here, here's a headline I think he responded to. Uh, and this was a quote, shut the blank up. So you called him out in the boldest of fashions, and he unfollowed you uh, right after that, correct? 
He did. And so I was very surprised when he called me. But we had a cordial conversation. It went on for nearly half an hour, actually, so a, a week ago on Saturday. Um, he was very bullish about his election chances, but we also had a chance to discuss his style. And you know, I said to him, whether you win or, or lose the election, uh, Mr. President, can I just say that the one thing which is a real fault line throughout your presidency is that because of your need to always be the strong, tough guy, uh, which is something I know he feels he has to do. You've forgotten how to be empathetic. And showing empathy as a world leader isn't a weakness. It's actually a great strength. What America needs from any president, whether they're Republican or Democrat, is, is a big wrapped arm around the country to say, I get it. I know you're suffering. I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And I'm afraid that even though I'm a friend of his, I have found Donald Trump's uh, presidency this year in handling these terrible events that have gone on, uh, really lacking in that empathy. And I think that's been a great shame. And when you said that to him, by, by the way, where were you when he called you? I was in this very room, actually. Uh, I got a call. It was the White House switchboard saying, I recognize the number, saying, we ha uh, Mr. Morgan, are you available to speak to the president? I, obviously, I toyed for a moment to say, actually, I'm busy right now. I'm watching the football. But I quickly said, of course, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, not to. And then on, on came that familiar voice. Right. And when you told him what you said about you need empathy, it's not a, a weakness, it's a strength. Uh, what did he say? He listened. Uh, he was respectful to what I had to say. I have to say I didn't in the, in the following 10 days see any evidence of him pivoting to be more empathetic. Uh, we saw a string of rallies in which he was still the big strong man uh, tough guy image that he wants to propagate. But I really think he can have it all in that sense. You know, you want strong leadership, but you also want somebody who at least shows the people who are losing loved ones. They're losing their livelihoods. They're fearful for their, for their money, for their families, for their kids, for putting food on the table. They want to know that the White House and the man or woman who is presiding over the presidency really understands what's going on. Well, this election in particular has divided families across the country like no other. Now, I'm adding two guests who are siblings and haven't seen each other for two years because they're opposing political outlooks. They'll be seeing each other for the first time on this stage, and uh, Piers and I are going to have some comments for them right after the break. The difference in political views have damaged our relationship. I think that President Trump is the man of the hour. I feel that my sister has been brainwashed. She drank the Kool-Aid. I watch Fox every day. Donald Trump has no ethics. I just want nothing to do with her. We're talking today about how the events of 2020, in particular the presidential election, have created disorder and division in our country. Now, my special guest today, editor-at-large at, at DailyMail.com, Piers Morgan, has written a revealing book all about the daily social and political chaos Americans have dealt with since January, titled Wake Up. My next guests, Joe and Simone, one Democrat, the other Republican, are siblings who say they haven't seen each other in person in two years due to their different political beliefs. Politics has come close to destroying the relationship I have with my sister Simone. I love my brother Joe, and we just don't see eye to eye when it comes to politics. He believes in Biden, and I think that President Trump is the man of the hour. My sister is on a steady diet of Fox News. I watch Fox every day. I would rather watch Fox than watch a movie. I love Fox. They're honest, sincere people. I feel that my sister has been brainwashed. She drank the Kool-Aid. I asked her how she could support someone who was so reckless and dishonest. And she told me point blank he hasn't broken any laws. I think all those little name callings that President Trump puts together are kind of very creative, like Pocahontas or Sleepy Joe. It's game playing, but it doesn't hurt anyone. Growing up, 
My impression of my sister was that she was a liberal. She had gay friends. And this is a very close subject to my heart because I'm a gay man. My brother Joe, he's homosexual, and I think that's part of his reason for wanting to gravitate towards a more progressive type of environment. He is not open to other views. He's really been indoctrinated by the media that is so hateful against Trump. This is my Trump mask. And I adore, I love it, because wherever I go, people ask me, oh, where did you get that? Donald Trump has no ethics or moral fiber. When I heard the Access Hollywood tape and they talked about grabbing women by the I was shocked. I've been around for a long time and guys will be guys. If Dr. Phil can bring my brother to the realization that even if our politics are different, we're still brother and sister. The difference in political views have damaged our relationship to the point where I just want to have nothing to do with her. Joe, how are you, sir? Uh, great. I'm Have a seat. shocked that we're here, actually. Well, you've not seen your sister for two years? Yep. Uh, but you're seeing her now. How does that feel? Uh, well, I, I, I love my sister. Right. Uh, How does it feel to see your brother after two years? It's a little weird because I didn't realize that we had this kind of problem. It just didn't occur to me that you've taken it to this level. I mean, it just doesn't seem like the fact that we are brother and sister and, and we've been together for so many years and we've gone through our ups and downs, I know, but this is a totally different situation. I mean, it just, I can't believe that, that I antagonize you so much. It's not a matter of antagonizing me. I feel disappointed. I feel betrayed. I have... I have to tell you a little bit about our history. My mother had me when she was 47 years old. My mother and sister are both Holocaust survivors. My mother was starting a new family, and she almost lost her life giving birth to me. So as a baby, I imprinted on my sister. So I have these dreams where it's you and it's mom, and I wake up, and I'm confused. I don't know, was I dreaming about my mother or my sister? And it's as if I woke up only to find out that my mother was really a Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer. And my sister lives on a steady diet of Fox News. I watch Fox News. I watch CNN. Um, I feel like she's been brainwashed. Well, th this is kind of what we're talking about today. Both of you know Pierce Morgan. Pierce has an opinion on who's going to win this election, and what's that going to do to this relationship? We'll ask Pierce what that is after the break. I wonder if, regardless of who's in power, if at the end of 100 years we are where we are, is it really worth sacrificing your relationship over who's in power at a given moment in history. I think my sister Simone has become a fear-mongering hater. She has Fox News blaring on every TV in every room of the house. I feel that President Trump is my friend. What I love about Trump is he's real. You feel his sincerity. And when people say they don't sense any sincerity in him, I wonder what planet they're living on. I feel defeated. I feel completely defeated. People have said we've never had such a divide in America. They seem to forget about what happened with the Vietnam War and people marching in the streets. They seem to forget about the Civil War where we're actually shooting each other. And I I'm talking about the fact that we're letting political issues actually divide the two of you. Look, this is about a choice to reorder your priorities. and. You know, I, I did a little calculation because I wonder sometimes how much difference there really is between the parties and what gets done. I look back over the last hundred years 
And, you know, it's been pretty equally divided between how many Democratic presidents and how many Republican presidents we've had. In fact, I think it's just one over the other. It's like 24, 25. And so I, I hear each side getting all self-righteous and sanctimonious. And you're wrong. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. They've each had a pretty equal chance to run their agenda, but yet we are where we are today. So I, I wonder if, regardless of who's in power, if at the end of 100 years we are where we are, is it really worth sacrificing your relationship over who's in power at a given moment in history? Well, Dr. Phil, for me, I don't really care who's in office as long as they're honest and ethical and don't interfere with my sleep at night. Under President Donald Trump's presidency, I can't sleep at night. I wake up every morning and I check the news feed to find out what has he done now. You know, has he nuked France? I mean, well, the man is a lunatic. Do you think the other side doesn't wake up and do that when, when the other side is in power? Come on. Well, all I know is that when Barack Obama was president, the Obamas brought dignity to the White in House. In your opinion, oh, yes. but that's your opinion. Pierce, who do you think is going to win this election? Well, last time I was one of the few voices to consistently say, I think Donald Trump's going to win. Yes. And everyone assumed Hillary would. This time, I'm, I'm not as confident. If you'd asked me in January, I'd have said Trump would have been comfortably re-elected. Things were going very well. The economy was strong. You could paint a, a pretty good, positive picture for Trump then. And then came the pandemic. And then came the George Floyd killing and protests. And he blew it. Now, whether he could pull off a miraculous, last-minute, seizing victory from the jaws of apparent defeat... I think it's a big ask even for him. Uh, the question really is, does he deserve to win? Did he deserve to get re-elected on the back of his leadership this year? I think that's a harder question for the American people. We're going to add another woman to this conversation, a minute who says the Trump administration has thrown her into a deep well of severe anxiety and depression. She wants to know how to navigate her way out of this. We'll talk about that next. I went to bed thinking Hillary had won and woke up to find out that Trump had won. This overwhelming feeling of depression hit me. If I see a Trump sign, I get angry. He's a sexist pig. I'm still joined by broadcaster and DailyMail.com editor-at-large, Pierce Morgan, whose new book, Wake Up, looks back over the past year where political and social turmoil have abounded. Now, my next guest, Alex, reached out to me because she says her power, strength, and resolve have been replaced with depression, anxiety, and rage after four years under the Trump administration. When I first heard that Donald Trump was running for office in 2016, I thought that it was a joke. I went to bed thinking that Hillary had won and woke up to find out that Trump had won. This overwhelming feeling of depression hit me. I remember crying and crying. It's hard for me to believe that somebody would vote for someone like him. If I see a Trump sign on the, the road, I get angry. I feel a lot of hatred. Even though I was raised in a Republican Christian home, I voted for Obama his second term. I voted for Hillary in 2016. I feel like everything that I was taught as a child, I feel like I was lied to. I was abused as a child, and when I see Donald Trump, when I hear the things that he says about women, it triggers that abuse for me. Honestly, he's, he's a sexist pig. When I hear Trump's voice, when I see his face on TV, it physically makes me sick. I don't really have a core group of friends anymore because a lot of them were Trump supporters. Donald Trump being in office caused me to rely on anti-anxiety medication every single day. I believe that if Trump is elected for a second term, that things are just going to get darker. I worry how I'm going to continue to live day to day. Dr. Phil, how will I survive four more years of Donald Trump if he's our president?
Well, joining me now virtually from Arizona is Alex. Alex, thank you for for joining us. Well, first of all, Dr. Phil, you're my hero, so I can't even tell you what it means to be here today. Thank um, you, thank you. No, thank you. I actually went back to college in my late 30s to get my degree in psychology because I was inspired by the work you do. So uh, thank you for having me on your show. I pray that my anxiety comes back down and I don't have to be on medication anymore. I mean, as we're talking, I can feel my heart racing, my blood pressure's gone up. Um, when I see the pictures of Donald Trump and even hear my own words, my anxiety kicks in. I hear what Joe is saying and I feel like I'm listening to my own words. I mean, I have said similar things about um, relationships I have. How do you put those boundaries in place? and then hold the people to those boundaries. Because I find that the Trump Trump supporters in my life tend to speak about him a lot more than the Biden supporters speak about Biden. I never even cared about politics, to be completely honest with you, until Donald Trump uh, won in 2016. Well, Pierce, does it surprise you that there's that much turmoil that, that, that Joe and, and Alex are saying that this has become so personal that it has actually affected their mental health on a day-to-day -day basis to the point of, of disrupting their, their quality of mental and emotional well-being. It's the self-righteous element on both sides, where it's not just enough to have an opinion. You have to have a view that your opinion is the only one that's allowed. And I think if you then have that view, and you see other people expressing different opinions, it sends people slightly nuts, and they get hysterical. And I'm like, calm down. And later... You've just made me so angry, and you've hurt me so deeply. Have either one of you heard anything I've said about spending time together and not talking about politics? Well, Pierce, does it surprise you that there's that much turmoil that, that, that Joe and, and Alex are saying that this has become so personal that it has actually affected their mental health on a day-to-day -day basis to the point of, of disrupting their, their quality of mental and emotional well-being? Well, I don't think it's just about politics. It doesn't surprise me. I think what's happened, and I detail this in the book, is that we've become very, very tribal, far worse than I can ever remember it in my lifetime. It's almost like we've regressed back 2,000 years to when we literally lived in tribes, and we never met anybody who was outside our tribe. And so we all thought the same, dressed the same, had the same opinions, did the same things, and then we wandered out and met these other tribes, and both tribes decided the only way to resolve their differences was kill each other. And now we've gone back to that ridiculous mindset. And my advice to your guest today, I have great respect for their opinions and for the anxiety that they're suffering here. But people need to be less self-righteous about their own opinions. It's fine to have your opinion, but it should be fine to respect other people's opinions exactly. and to challenge them and to argue and debate, but not fall out with people. And I think it's the self-righteous element on both sides where it's not just enough to have an opinion. You have to have a view that your opinion is the only one that's allowed. And I think if you then have that view and you see other people expressing different opinions, it sends people slightly nuts and they get hysterical. And I'm like, calm down. <laughs> Let's all get our perspective right again. This pandemic should change everything. And the key thing it should change is an ability to stop all shouting at each other and become a little bit more civil. My dad used to say, boy, you need to spend 5% of your time deciding whether you got a good deal or a bad deal, and 95% of your time deciding what you're going to do about it. You have to decide, okay, what am I going to do to maximize my life, to maximize my relationship with my sister, to control my anxiety, to control my depression? 5% of the time deciding whether it's a good deal or bad, and 95% of the time saying, what coping strategies can I adopt? How can I accommodate to this? What can I do to bring about change, become an activist, 
manage my anxiety, depression, relationships, whatever. What am I going to do about it? Not being a victim, but being self-determined. Now, we've seen how stress and anxiety can run amok at a time like this. So how do we regain control of our emotions? I put together a, a formula that I think is important, and I'll share it with you next. Years ago, when I went to her house, and she was like, come on down, sit on the couch next to me, let's talk. I sit down on the couch, Fox News is on. I'm like, can we turn this off? Oh, oh, wait, I want to listen to this. And it's that god-awful Judge Janine. Yeah, tape it and play it later. <laughs> now, have either one of you heard anything I've said about spending time together and not talking about politics? This is your sister, and you're going to feel really happy if you spend some quality time with her and don't talk about politics, you'll, you, you will, you'll appreciate spending some time no, with I'm her. I'm willing. I'm totally willing. I don't have to talk about politics. But really, just... I you've mean, just really. made me so angry, and you've hurt me so deeply. I, I, I just... You, you have to, hurt to me To begin with, deeply. I had no idea this was affecting you this way. You're painting her with the Trump brush, and she's not Trump. She's your sister. I begged you to turn the TV off so we could have a conversation. And you just won't do it. I'm saying, you, give, <laughs> give each other a chance to hit the reset button and, and give it a fresh beginning. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. There you go. There you go. That's he all you need to do. He says he's willing. He's just, meet me halfway. You're right, right here. Meet him halfway. Well, I'm back with Pierce Morgan, Joe, Simone, and Alex from Arizona. And we've been talking about all of these times that are going on right now. And at the break, Joe was saying, you know what? I'm through keeping my mouth shut. And, you know, that may be one of the most important coping mechanisms you have is giving your feelings a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, really speaking out about how you feel. You have to do what works for you. And it begins with forgiving yourself for whatever you haven't done that you should have done or done that you shouldn't have done. You have to consciously manage your reactions. You don't have to react every time you can. You need to take care of your body physically, which means you've got to exercise regularly, eat right, do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself physically. You need to practice relaxation techniques such as visualization and progressive muscle relaxation it's important that you manage your physiological stress in your body i mean even just taking a moment to breathe deeply at least once a day you have no idea how this resets what's called homeostasis in your body and it lasts for hours after you do it so those things can make a really big difference. And I'm going to put that list on drphil.com. And I really hope you two will make a choice to have an active brother-sister relationship. Because when one of you is gone, they're gone forever. Absolutely. Uh, I buried a sister within the last year. Robin's buried a sister within the last year. And I, I just hope and, and pray that you will choose to not let something over which you have no control dictate your relationship. Uh, we're out of time. I want to thank my guest today. Special thanks to Piers Morgan, DailyMail.com editor at large, uh, host of Good Morning Britain, and author of Wake Up, which is available now. Now stick around tomorrow because we're going to talk about something I am very passionate about, controversial Cancel culture.